hold to God's unchanging hand. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you on this day, lifting up our hearts in praise and in thanksgiving. We thank you for another day. We thank you because you watched over us from one week to another. We thank you, oh God, uh, because you are faithful. Oh God, uh, we thank you for your forgiveness. God, we thank you for your mercy and uh, for your grace. Almighty Father, we thank you because you offer us a hand uh, that you will never let go. So give us the mind and uh, give us the spirit, Lord, uh, to hold on uh, to your hand. Uh, help us to lean not unto our own understanding, uh, but in all our ways uh, acknowledge you, uh, God, and you promise that you will, uh, you shall, uh, direct our paths. Amen. Uh, God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for our Lord, uh, our Savior, and our Redeemer. We thank you, God, uh, that we have a right to eternal life through the shedding of his blood uh, and his resurrection. But God, he didn't stop there and we thank you right now that he sits at the right hand, Father God, uh, being an intercessor for our prayers. Uh, and for that, uh, we say thank you. Father, we thank you for those who have assembled today on this day that uh, the world calls Super Bowl. Uh, but God, we're going to declare it Super Sunday because it is your day. And let everything that has Hallelujah. breath, Lord, uh, praise your holy name. Uh, God, we just glorify you. We magnify your name. Uh, may you be glorified and uh, honored in this service on today. God, we pray uh, for the leadership of this church, for our pastor and for the clergy staff and all of our officers, God, and all of those who, whether given a title or not, that they cheerfully give of their own. So God, we thank you. Father, there is turmoil on every hand. Uh, your word said wars uh, and rumors of wars. Uh, there's trouble within uh, and trouble without. Uh, God, we pray uh, for this church called uh, the African Episcopal Methodist Church. God, you know what we stand in need of, uh, so we just ask your mercy and your loving kindness. Father, we pray for the third district, for the leadership, and uh, for all those who serve within. Father God, let your will be done. Your ways are not our ways, uh, and your timing is not our timing. So help us, God, to be patient and to wait upon you, God, for you have uh, the final say. Oh, Lord, uh, in spite of all we've been through and because of all that we've been through, God, uh, uh, we need a word from Ojai this day. Uh, Father God, uh, we ask that you send your preacher that you send the anointing. And then, Father, give us ears to hear and a heart to serve. God, we thank you for the power of your word. And we thank you that you are a promise keeper. We thank you that all that's going on you promised, uh, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Oh, God, despite what we stand in need of, uh, you promise, Father, that you will supply all of our needs through your son, Christ Jesus. So God, we 
invite you. We know you're already here in this service, but we open up our hearts, Father, that you be glorified and uh, that we would be edified. We thank you, God, and be with us during this upcoming week. Father, this is our prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus, Jesus, the name that there is, uh, no other name, Jesus, the name that at that name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Let the church say amen, amen, and amen. in the house. Come on, some of those old saints in here. I don't feel God's brought you from a mighty, mighty love. What do you want us to know? It's like fire shut up in my bones right now, y'all. I pray for our oldest saints in here. Nobody told you the road would be easy. But I don't believe he's brought you this far to leave here. Stay encouraged, amen.
Amen. Let us stand all over the sanctuary as we join in the reading, in our scripture reading for today, which comes from the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus, the first chapter, beginning at the 22nd verse and ending in the second chapter at the 10th verse. The book of Exodus, the first chapter, beginning at the 22nd verse, where we find these words. 
Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now a man of the tribe of Levi, of Levi rather, married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated in the presence of our God. If we have anyone who is visiting with us for the first time, if you would stand now so that we can acknowledge your presence. Any first time guests with us today? Amen. Well, we are all at home. Let the church of God say amen. I said, is anybody grateful? This is just one of those Sunday mornings for me, y'all. I'm just grateful. Grateful for my hands. Grateful for my voice. Grateful to be able to see, to put one foot in front of the other. I'm just grateful. You ever had a grateful party where you just start saying, Lord, thank you? Just walk through the house, touching chairs. Thank you, Lord, for the chair. Thank you for a window to just look out the window, Lord. Thank you for a window to look out of. That's a car puts it this way.
this gratefulness. Men, I want you to come and sing for them. Give them a testimony this morning. grateful this morning come on don't stop praising him now anybody grateful this morning hallelujah 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 in the first chapter of the book of exodus we find these words then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile. I want, us to, want you to pray with me these few moments from the subject, I'm still shining. I'm still shining. Let us pray. God, we love you because you first loved us. God, we're grateful today because last night could have been our last night. God, we're grateful today because can't nobody do us like you can. God, we're grateful today because 
If we had 10,000 tongues, it wouldn't be enough to say thank you. Now breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I might love as thou would love, and do what thou wouldst do. God, I give you honor and I give you praise because of this moment in ministry. Now bless as only you can and allow no flesh to glory in your sight. Somebody is unsaved or unchurched or looking for a church home. Use this word as a rhema word. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, amen. I'm still shining. Have you ever thought about your worth? Have you ever taken the time to think about what value you have? Have you ever considered the fact that you are blessed and you are not down and out because obviously you mean something to God? And for somebody, you gathered in this place, either physically or virtually, but you struggle with that because you're anxious about stuff and you're stressed about life and you're bothered by circumstances because you keep anticipating that something is going to happen in your life that you are not ready for. In other words, you keep thinking that the worst may come. But I want you to recognize today that nothing when God is on your side can destroy you. And therefore, even when life goes wrong, God still can make it right. And so somebody, somebody, I've not pulled in your driveway yet because you keep saying to yourself, what else can go wrong in my life? What else can my boss try to do to destroy me? What else can go on to mess up my marriage? What else can go on in my health to make me want to lose or to cause a quit? What else can go on in my inner circle that will make me want to make me want to say like DMX, y'all gonna make me act a fool up in here, up in here. But before you start acting like DMX, before you lower your standards and before you become lower than the you that God called you to be I dare you I double dog dare you to just remember you matter to God almighty and obviously obviously you must be doing something right because the devil doesn't have to mess with you when you are doing what he would have you to do and so whenever you find yourself perplexed whenever you find yourself discouraged whenever you find yourself wanting to give in that ought to be your moment to shout and give God praise because you recognize you must be upsetting something that the devil wants you to do and am I on anybody's street right early in this message do I have six people I'll make number seven who can say I must be upsetting the devil after all that I've been through and so my brothers and sisters you've got to keep doing all you can to make sure that you are you keep the faith and whatever you're wrestling with whatever is going wrong don't let this world don't let this life don't don't let your emotions, don't let your feelings, don't let anybody or anything steal your shine. But you keep on shining. In fact, I need you to just take a few moments in this message. And I want you to think about some situations. Think about some things in life that try to steal your shine. Think about some things that you've been through that try to block your blessings. And now you can look back over them and laugh and thank God for what you've been through because you sat there while they were trying to destroy you sat there while they tried to give up on you you sat there but you're still here and you're still shining do I have anybody here who can celebrate the fact that you're shining that's why you refuse to have a panic attack that's why you refuse to have a stroke that's why you've not lost your mind that's why you keep your head up because you can say after all I've been through, I'm still shining. Is there anybody here who can say trouble comes on every hand, but I'm still shining? Come on in here, Jesus. Jesus said in this world, you shall have tribulation, but don't get discouraged. You shall overcome. Anybody determine you're going to shine anyhow? 
Anybody determined you're going to shine anyhow? Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I'm going to shine anyhow. In fact, I'm still shining. After everything I've been through, I'm still shining. After all the tears, I'm still shining. After the divorce, I'm still shining. After the discouragement, I'm still shining. I need about six of you to get on this train and declare I'm still shining. That's what we find. That's what we find, Sister Angela, in the text. We find Jochebed, the mother of Moses. In verse 22, in verse 22, Reverend Harper, we see a death-dealing policy that has been handed down by Pharaoh to the people. See, that's why, my brothers and sisters, we can't turn our backs on social justice because public policy always has a way of showing up in consequences at our own doorstep. I always understand that even though they're passing policies in D.C. and they're passing policies downtown and they're passing policies in Columbus, don't ever get it twisted. Those same laws have a way of showing up on your front doorstep and messing with you. See, in this particular passage, there is a death-dealing policy that targets a group of people. It sounds like these United States of America or as Maya Angelou would say these divided states of America. There are death dealing policies that are passed to target a particular group of people. Can I come home and get about six of you? Because I'll never understand why in this country we ban books but we don't ban guns. I can't understand it. Uh, if you're going to ban books that talk about our history, why don't you ban some guns that will preserve our history. Preach Covington. I'm trying to. And so death dealing policies are taking place in this passage. But I feel I feel. Be seated brother Shamal. I'm coming back to get you. I feel for, for Jochebed who is the mother of this little boy that would later be named Moses. Now can you imagine the anxiety she's deal, dealing with? Can you imagine the tension Sister Sonia she's dealing with? She gets married. She's living in a time with a pharaoh that knew not Joseph. Now, if you do your homework, you know that there was a Pharaoh prior to this Pharaoh who said, I'm going to make sure that you experience abundance and sufficiency. But now a Pharaoh arises who knew not Joseph. And so the political climate changed. And the Bible lets us know that there were those who were oppressed because there will always be people who tried to oppress you. There will always people, always be people who tried to suppress you and if on this second Sunday in Black History Month I'm preaching to some people who know something about being oppressed and know something about being suppressed but you can say I'm still shining even, even through the oppression and through the suppression. See this Pharaoh comes along and says now I'm going to, I'm going to implement a bill that will become law and the law will state that every boy that is born to a Hebrew will be thrown into the Nile River. I mean, can you imagine the plight of Sister Jochebed, a pregnant woman, a married woman. She gives birth to a boy, but by law it says she's got to throw him in the Nile River. And so the law goes on to say that he's supposed to be dead by sundown. And the Bible lets us know that when she saw her son, when she held her son, she recognized that he was beautiful. She was determined I'm not going to get rid of my boy and the Bible goes on to let us know that she refused as a mother that, that during a time of a death dealing policy she refused to give in to death but instead there she did she was determined that her blessing would live and I want to tell somebody I want you to keep the faith and be de and keep the determination in your spirit that your blessing shall live see there are those who who want us to abort our future and abort our hope and abort our help. But somebody came to Quinn Chapel today and you're pregnant with possibility but life wants you to give up on the very thing that you're pregnant with. I don't know what it is for you but I don't know what it is you're hoping for. I don't know what it is you're praying for. I don't know what's on the inside of you and you keep talking to God about it but life wants you to abort the very thing that God has for you. But 
I believe I've got somebody, somebody, somebody up in here who can say, I refuse to abort my future. I refuse to abort my hope. I refuse to abort my dreams. I refuse to give up on my child. I refuse to give up on my health. I refuse to give up on my family. Is there any, 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 anybody here who can say, I refuse to give up? Oh, not when God is on my side. And so God, God gets in, God gets involved in this situation with Jacobet. And I want somebody here who's pregnant to recognize that God will get involved so that you can keep on shining. Even when life is calling for an abortion, you can keep on shining. Even when the doctor is calling for an abortion, you can keep on shining. Even when your mental health is calling for an abortion, you can keep on shining. Anybody determined to just keep on shining? Anybody determined? to just keep on hoping. Anybody determined, you're going to keep your hope alive. It was, it was Toni Morrison in her book, Beloved, where she expressed the life of mothers who find themselves, uh, black mamas, who find themselves as conduits, not for birth, not just for birth, but for merchandise, for property, to be sold, to be taken advantage of by the massa. Black, black women, as mothers in this country, they have a way of creating something out of nothing. Black mamas have have a way. That's what we're going to celebrate on this second Sunday of Black History Month. I want y'all to celebrate some mama, some grand. I want you to celebrate somebody who had some. I thank God for a good black mama who knew how to take hog guts and make chitlins. I'm glad for a good black mama who knew how to take pot liquor and make good gravy. I'm glad for a good mama who knew how to take old bananas and make banana pudding. Is there anybody up in here who can say if I can't celebrate anything else I can celebrate God for somebody who knew how to take what other folks were trying to, trying to dispose of and God made something out of nothing. Somebody say yes. And so because of that, we can keep on shining. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. But uh, you may not know Rihanna because Rihanna, this may not be a Rihanna crowd. You know something about Rihanna, don't you? Rihanna has a song uh, that where she says, through lyrical expression, shine bright like a diamond. And maybe, maybe you can't connect with that. You're too holy for that. But when I heard this, it said something to me that I needed to use because have you ever thought about the anxiety? Have you ever thought about all of the tension? Have you ever thought about everything that a diamond has to go through just to show up on your finger? I need to come get you before I get to my first point because a diamond doesn't just show up and automatically start shining. No, they begin as a lump of coal. Uh, the lump of coal has to be exposed to some heat and some pressure. And the more heat and the more pressure that that lump of coal is exposed to all of a sudden it gives way to a beautiful diamond the diamond is cut and it does not once it's cut it does not take away from its value it adds to its value so when you see a diamond on your finger or when you see a diamond under some glass when you see some, a diamond in a glass case you want to shout at the diamond but I want to tell you the diamond wants to shout back at you because the diamond and wants to testify. I know what it is to be under pressure. I know what it is to endure some heat. I know what it is to be put through some hell, but I'm not looking this good because I've always been good. I'm looking this good because through it all, God brought me out. Through it all, God let me shine. And somebody, somebody, you made it to Quinn Chapel and you saying you looking at a diamond this morning. Am I preaching to any diamonds this morning? I mean, am I preaching to anybody who Who's been through anything? Ah, uh, somebody made their way. A diamond's been lied on this week. A diamond's been talked about this week. A, lie, a diamond's been persecuted this week. But you made your way to Quinn Chapel, and a diamond is waving holy hands, and a diamond is clapping their hands, and a diamond is giving God some praise. Is there anybody here who can say I'm shining like a diamond because God has brought me through it all? And I made it through the pressure. There are three things that come out of this text, and I'm through. Can I give you three things that come out of the text? First of all, God can plant, God can plant seeds of possibility in the dirt of your hurt. I, it took me a while to get that. Y'all got to help me a little better than you are. 
God can plant seeds of possibility in the dirt of your hurt. Verse 1 of the text says, about this time, a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi got married. See, the woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw her son, she recognized that it, he was beautiful. That's what the text says in one translation. And she did what only a mother could do. Do you know that the world, uh, that the word, rather, the word beautiful in the Hebrew is the same word that was used in Genesis chapter 1 when God looked at chaos and God brought a cosmos out of chaos? And see, God, when God brought something out of nothing, God looked at all that he did and he said it's good. So the word, so the same word in Genesis comes back to us in the book of Exodus, the second chapter, the second verse. God said, or she said rather that's beautiful don't forget don't forget the good stuff can come out of chaos don't ever forget that blessings can come out of burdens don't ever forget that limping can come out of le leaping rather can come out of limping don't ever forget that God can turn a situation around have I got any company in here and so the Bible lets us know that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form it was void and darkness covered the face of the deep. That was chaos, if you will. And God speaks to chaos and creates a cosmos out of chaos. So if you go to chapter 2, there is chaos going on. There is a policy in force that says that every Hebrew boy that is born must be thrown into the Nile River. And the Bible says that when Jochebed heard that her baby boy was born, or when, when Jochebed saw her baby boy, when she saw saw him. She recognized him to be good. And you, if you know God for yourself, you know that only God can bring something out of nothing. Only God can create something out of chaos because God can plant seeds of possibilities in the dirt of your hurt. And I hope, I hope today that I don't have to shout by myself because somebody in here, I don't care how stiff you may be, but if you look in the rear view mirror of your life, there have been some dirty circumstances that God has brought you through. If you just look in the rear view mirror of your circumstances, God has planted possibilities there. And before you could figure it out, God allowed the dirt to, God put in the dirt something you needed and allowed something to emerge in order that you might keep on keeping on. See, sometimes, sometimes we got to thank God for the dirt that we've been through. Because if it had not been for a dirt situation. Is there anybody here who can testify? It was the dirt, that, but it did not drown me. It was dirty, but it did not kill me. It was dirty, but it did not ruin me. It was dirty, but it did not take my life. It was dirty, but it did not take me out. It was dirty, but I did not lose my mind. It was dirty, but I did not lose my job. It was dirty, but I did not lose my life. Is there any, 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 any anybody here who can say I've been through some dirty situations but I thank God the dirt didn't kill me I've been through some dirty situations but the dirt did not take me out in fact God allowed God gave me an atmosphere to blossom because all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord but then the second thing to come out of the text second thing to come out of the text is that when you're at wit's end remember the divinity within when you're at wit's end, remember the divinity within. Uh, now, let me come get you. The text says she saw that he was good or that he was beautiful. So she hid him for three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket, coated it with asphalt and pitch, placed the child in the basket, put the basket, uh, walked, uh, set it along the reeds on by the bank of the Nile. And when you are at your wit's end, don't forget the divine power God gives you within. So you will reach this, you will reach a point at all, all of us, will pre reach a point in our lives when we don't know what to do. But that's, but the good news is that's when God steps in. All of us will reach an impasse where we don't 
don't know what to do. And we'll be like Fannie Lou Hamer who said, I'm tired of being sick and tired. When you're at your wit's end, can you imagine what Jochebed is going through? Her child is growing. So her love for her child is growing. And while her child is growing and her love for her child is growing, the Bible says she can hear the anguish and the cries of the other people, the other parents as they have to throw their ba their babies in the water. And so can you imagine all that is racing through her mind like relentless soldiers? That, can you imagine listening to all of that crying? Imagine the anxiety as she knows she can't keep hiding her son. She can't, she's got to dump him in the Nile River. I mean, this sister has a whole lot going on in her mind. She's struggling, but she refuses to do that which she was forced by law to do. See, the weight of the world is on her shoulder. The walls are coming in. The time bomb is ticking. The quicksand is about to take her under. But watch what the Bible says, because the Bible lets us know that while she is at wit's end, she still got some good sense within. And I don't want you to let this point get past you, because don't, and don't let this point go over your head, because there are some things that, ought, that you just ought to praise and magnify God for because when you think about the fact that you didn't always know what to do but God put a thought in your head you got an idea that came to your mind and that you could not have come up with all by yourself so whenever you can make sense of stuff and you get with God God will help you make sense and when you're at your wits end and you think things are about to end God will give you a strategy if you just turn it over to him and watch him work it out. Sometimes we try to plan things and we try to work things out. But the Bible says, the Bible lets us know for ourselves that our thoughts are not his thoughts and our ways are not his ways. And therefore we got to thank God for divine favor. But we got to thank God for divine wisdom. In fact, I believe I'm preaching to somebody who can testify I didn't have sense enough to do it for myself. But God God gave me sense to do it. I didn't have the intelligence enough to do what needed to be done, but God gave me what I needed to get past my storm and to get past my situation and to get past my setback and to get past my struggle. As here she was at the end of her rope, she puts him in the Nile, but she said, I will do what I have to do. She built a, a, an ark, if you will, put a basket together, put him in that basket and let it float down float on what was supposed to drown him. She, it was because of her faith that she put him, uh, she put him in that little ark and allowed her to, allowed Moses to float on what was supposed to drown him. And I want to tell you, if you walk by faith and not by sight, if you know God for yourself, there'll be things that'll try to drown you. There will be things that will try to take you out. But God said, if you hang in there, I'm going to let you float on the very thing that tried to take you out. I'm going to let you float on the very thing that was trying to destroy you. I'm going to let you float on the very thing that tried to take you under. And I'm preaching to somebody by way of the Holy Spirit. You should have drowned. You should have overdosed. You should have been dead and gone. But the Lord let you live on. Is there anybody here who can say, I'm glad God allowed me to float on the very thing that should have taken me out. I wish I had some floaters in here who could say float on. I'm floating on. I'm floating on it. I'm floating on it. I could have lost my mind, but I'm floating on it. Is there anybody here who could say I'm glad I'm still afloat? After all of it, I'm still afloat. After all they tried to do, I'm still afloat. Can anybody celebrate the fact that no weapon formed against you has been able to prosper and you're floating on the very thing that was supposed to drown you. Well, there's one more thing to come out of the text and I'm through. The third thing is this. You have to release before increase. You have to release before you can increase. The text says, and I'm, I'm almost there. The text said she had to let the baby go. Can't you see this mother struggling? Can't you see this mother stressing? 
Here it is. He's too young to fight for himself. Too young to speak for himself. Too young to understand for himself. But she has to release him and let him go. And there are times when you've got to learn how to release, and that is the rough part. And you've got to be honest because all of us have to get to the place where we realize that there's only so much we can do. I don't care how long you've been doing it, there's only so much you can do. I don't care how good and how strong you are, there's only so much you can do. But when you let go, you can watch God do what you can't do. When you let go, you can watch God fix what you can't fix. When you let had anybody ever watch God do what you could not do. And that's why you got to keep on praying. Keep praying because God can handle what you can't handle. The old folk used to say it like this. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Well, you know the rest of the story. It's because of the courage of this mother who released her son that she was able to let him go. And Moses was a mighty man of valor. He ended up in the place of, the, of Pharaoh, in the hands rather, of Pharaoh's daughter. Now remember, Pharaoh's daughter went down there to the Nile to bathe. This is the same Pharaoh who called and, and wanted them to kill every Hebrew boy. Pharaoh's daughter tells her servants, go and get the basket. They get the basket and the baby boy Moses is crying. Her heart goes out to this little crying baby boy. Now don't miss your shout because she went because she went she got to the basket just at the right time. The mother placed the basket on the Nile just at the right time. Pharaoh's daughter showed up right just at the right time. And that is called divine timing. It is the providence of God. In verses 21 and 22 of chapter 1 all the way to verse 10 of chapter, or chapter verses 21 and 22 of chapter 1 all the way to verse 10 of chapter 2 you will discover that God is not mentioned. And you do know every now and then God gets silent. But don't get it twisted. God is still active. In other words, even when God goes silent, doesn't mean that God is still. God may be silent, but don't ever lose heart because God is still up to something. Can I get a witness here? So not only did he end up surviving, but he was able to grow up in the palace. And when you release, that's when God will give him increase what pharaoh meant for evil god he worked it out for his worked it out for jacobin's good aren't you glad today god can work it out for your good oh kirk carr said it this way kirk carr said it this way for every mountain you brought me over for every trial you seen me through for every burden hallelujah anybody glad today that god has a way of bringing you through every mountain well i'm closing now but i'm gonna need your help to close this sermon because I want you to think about the pharaohs you've endured in life. I want you to take a moment and look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, have you ever had to deal with Pharaoh? Have you ever had to work with Pharaoh? Have you ever had to work for Pharaoh? Have you ever had to endure a Pharaoh? Well, I got good news for you. You can say for every Pharaoh, you brought me over. For every Pharaoh, you've seen me through. For every Pharaoh, I shall hallelujah is there anybody here who can shout today because you recognize that Pharaoh is not your battle that trouble is not your battle but the battle belongs to the Lord and therefore you gonna hang on in there because God will see you through good morning Quinn Chapel may the Lord God bless you real good but I need somebody to go ahead and bless his name bless his name bless his name because you're still shining. You are still surviving. You are still pressing. You are still praying. You are still worshiping. You are still stepping. You are still going. You are still flowing. You are still getting up. You are still making it through. Is there anybody here who can say, I'm still shining. I'm still dancing. I'm still glorifying. God's been good to me. God made a way for me. I need somebody. I need somebody. 
I need somebody to give him praise because you're still shining. You're still surviving. You're still giving him glory. You're still waking up, still making up, still glorifying the name of our God. I will submit to you today, Jochebed had a rough testimony. But you know, preachers say we have three points. Sister Rosetta, we always have more than three points. I got a fourth one. I got a fourth one. And that is, if you look at this text, not only did Pharaoh grow up, not only did Pharaoh survive, but God made his enemy pay for it. That, some of y'all won't get that till about Tuesday. But, the, but somebody understands what I just said. Because if you look at the text, if you look at the text, he grew up in the enemy's camp. Which means that every, every piece of bread he ate, the enemy paid for it. Every time he went to get some Gatorade out of the refrigerator, the enemy paid for it. Every time, every, every time he went to get some milk out of the refrigerator, the enemy paid for it. And I want to tell somebody, you just keep on shining. God may even make the enemy pay for it. But you just keep on shining. God will see you through. The story of Jacobed is a story that a lot of people can, can testify to. Somebody wanted you to give up on your dream. Somebody wanted you to abort your own mission. But God gave you some special intelligence to put it on the Nile River, to put it in the Lord's hands, and he worked it out. Have I got a witness here? Did he work it out? Did he work it out? As we stand all over this sanctuary, there is a Jacobed standing right now. There is an individual standing right now who has a Jacobed like spirit. And you're discouraged because that you, you feel like you're, you have to abort your own dream. But I want to encourage you today Put that dream in the Nile. The Nile represents the hand of God. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Leave them there. Leave them there. That was an old hymn we used to sing. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. I encourage you today to leave them there. If you're here this morning and you've not given your life to Christ, I encourage you to come right now. If you're in this sanctuary and you have not accepted Jesus in the free pardon of your sin, I invite you to come now. The doors of the church are open and God is patiently waiting on you. If you're here today and you're saying, Preacher, I've given my life to Christ but I don't have a church home or I'm looking for a church home or I want to unite with a body of believers so that I can grow. I haven't been, I have not been growing lately. I want to grow in the word and in the will of God. If that's you, I encourage you to come right now. This is your moment. This invitation is extended to you. Why don't you come? God is patiently waiting on you. I know we talk about tomorrow. Tomorrow may be too late. And so why not come right now? Wherever you are, why don't you come? He will surely bring you out. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Is there one today? Leave them there. Oh, leave them there. If you trust and never die, he will surely bring you out. Take your burden. Is there one this morning? God is waiting on you. 
Why don't you come? Oh, leave them there. Is there one today? presence of our God. Leave them there. Leave them there. As we prepare to give, we serve a good God. Come on, y'all can do better than that. We serve a good God. And so let us prepare to give. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you, God, for the Nile River and the wisdom you've had for us to throw some things in the Nile. Now, God, help us to give, not grudgingly, not out of necessity, but help us to give according to your word. Because your word says, if we just try you, you'll open up the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing that we don't have room to receive. Please, be pleased, God, with our worship as we worship you through our giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to give, let me just share a few very quick announcements. First of all, this Wednesday at 630, we will gather for our Ash Wednesday worship experience. Also on Thursday, many of us will travel to Wilberforce University. I've been asked to be the Founders Day speaker. And so at 11 o'clock, we will be there. Uh, on a very sad note, our, black, our red and black gala has been postponed. And so those of you who uh, have already paid for your tickets, you'll be reimbursed. But please give us an opportunity to um, give us an opportunity to prepare for all of that logistically, and you will receive those necessary reimbursements. Also, uh, let me ask that all parents and all grandparents and anyone who has a child, neighbor, please be advised of all of the things that are taking place with our youth ministry. You all can start passing the baskets. I think they can give and listen. I pray they can. Uh, remember that the lock-in, the lock-in is uh, on next Sunday from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Amen. Also, the YPD is sponsoring the Super Bowl of Caring. And so we want to give throughout the month of February. Our new members class continues each Sunday. And so please govern yourself, yourselves accordingly. We're going to pray for the family of Brother Ollie Scott, who transitioned, and his funeral will be next Sunday. I believe it's at 3 p.m. The visitation is at 2 p.m. Amen? Amen. Did you say Sunday? Next Sunday, yes. Okay. Let, us, let us prepare. Let us continue to give as God has blessed us.
me also share, many of you will recognize in the fellowship hall, we have a new, we have a new floor down. Somebody say amen. And I want to thank Brother Wayne Edmondson, who helped us to initiate that. Come on, let's celebrate him. Brother Bobby, who helped to continue it, it continue until it, we, it came into fruition. And so let's just celebrate the let's just celebrate the blessing that God has given to our congregation. Amen. Let us stand. All things come of thee. Amen. Amen. You may be seated at this time. I'm going to ask Brother Jeremiah Wilson, who will come now and share in our, on our, in our Founders Day message. Is that right? Amen. Will you come? Good morning, Quinn Chapel. Once again, you are met with me, Jeremiah Wilson, but... I feel like a lot of you know me in name only, so allow me to give you a bit more insight into who I am. My name is Jeremiah Wilson. I am the current president of the North Ohio, South Ohio Conference of the YPD. I'm 17 years old, a senior in high school, and what I want to do after that is I want to be a teacher. Now, I see a lot of applause today, but I haven't even started the presentation. So, can we uh, please get our per first slide here on the screen? If there are no issues with that, of course, but I wouldn't know about that. There we go. Be perfect, perfect. Now, allow me to read you a little, little history. The AMEC, which is an acronym for the African American Episcopal Church, grew out of the Free, American Soci or Free African Society, the FAS, which Richard Allen, Absalom Jones, and others established in Philadelphia in 1787, when officials at St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church, notice the lack of the A in there, pulled blacks off their knees while praying. FAS members, discovering just how far American Methodists would go to enforce racial discrimination against African Americans. Hence, these members of St. George's made plans to transform their mutual aid society into an African congregation. Now, I ain't here to preach, but I'm gonna speak to y'all a little bit. These Black people, they praise the same God as those that sought to pull them off their knees. We were their brothers and sisters, and yet they wanted to take us away from the connection that we had established with our God. Now, obviously, this discrimination didn't stand. We had to do something about that, and so these people... These men came together and they established a congregation. Now, it's like, like Pastor Covington said earlier today, to uh, keep on shining. It's easy to do that today. It's easy to just ignore people. It's easy to move on. But back in the day, it wasn't ever that easy because they stopped you from having the slightest bit of spiritual connection because they believed that we were dirty. They believed that we were filthy. We, they believed that we did not belong with them. But we, as African Americans, have as much right to praise the man that brought us into this world just as much as they do because we are the children of God. Now let's bring us to our next slide. <laughs> Now, this part is going to be a bit geographical. Allow me to explain this to y'all. The geographical spread of the AMEC prior to the Civil War 
was mainly restricted to the Northeast and Midwest. That's where we are, by the way. Major congregations were established in Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., and here's a familiar name, Cincinnati, Chicago, Detroit, and other large blacksmith shop cities. Numerous northern communities also gained a substantial substantial ambient presence. Now, y'all heard the name Cincinnati, right? Y'all should understand that what we are standing on, where we sit right now, this is history, but not just history, black history. Y'all know the month, but what if we go a bit further beyond just black history? This is black esoteric history. Now, I just throw out a buzzword there. Allow me to explain what esoteric means. Esoteric is the word that is not easily understood. Now, when I speak this history to y'all, y'all can't quite grasp it at first glance because it's not just about how this came to be because the real history book, that's the Holy Bible. Y'all read that every day, well, at least I hope every day, and y'all come in here every Sunday, y'all hear the word, y'all pray about it. And it's that word that people have followed for many years that led to the creation of this congregation that we have, the African Methodist Episcopal Churches. So when I give you this history lesson, let it not be known that this is simply a one and done. Because every Sunday you come in here, you learn a little bit more history about where you've come from, the past that the, your ancestors have paid forward for you. This Bible, this is your history book. Pastor Covington, he's your tutor. And the Lord above, that is your professor. And me, I'm just a smart kid in class that y'all asked to copy the homework from. Can we go to our next slide, please? These are some very important faces and names that y'all should commit to memory, just as I have. The most significant era of demographical development occurred during the Civil War and Reconstruction, oftentimes with the permission of Union Army officials and the clergy moved into the states of the collapsing Confederacy to pull newly freed slaves into their denomination. Here's a bit of a quote. I seek my brethren, the title of an often repeated sermon that Theopolis G. Stewart preached in South Carolina became a clarion call to evangelize fellow blacks in Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Texas, and many other parts of the South. Hence, in 1800 AME membership reached 400,000 because of its rapid spread below the Manson-Dixon line when Bishop Henry M. Turner pushed African Methodism across the Atlantic into Liberia and Sierra Leone in 1891 and into South Africa in 1896. The AME now laid claim to adherence of two continents. Now, do y'all understand the, the significance of such a spread? Two whole continents. And all this started just because the American people couldn't let us sit down and worship our God. So you know what we did instead? We created our own space because the people are not our barrier between God. We ourselves are that bridge. And so we brought each other into a place where we could build that bridge, that connection with the Lord in a safe place. Though, and even to this day, there are people that seek to tear that sort of thing down because no matter what, they can't bear to see us stand alongside them. Time and time again, throughout all of history, have we come together to show the people that we are just as capable as they are. We are just as strong as they are. We have as much of a connection to the Lord as they do. They should know by now in this modern era where black excellence runs rampant throughout these streets. Let me, a young man in high school, be an example to the people that we will always be 
right alongside them. No matter how much they try to cleanse us from this world that we have earned the right to live in, they cannot sit us down. Because no matter what, no matter what happens, no matter what earth-shattering event goes on, no matter what controversy sprouts, we will always get right back up, right alongside them. Now hold the applause, I ain't done, I got one more slide. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. All right, let's see. While the AME is doctrinally Methodist, clergy, uh, clergy scholars, and laypersons have written important works which demonstrate the distinctive theology and praxis which have defined the Wesleyan body, Bishop Benjamin w. w. Amet, in, in an address to the 1803 World's Parliament of Religions, reminded the audience of the presence of blacks in the formation of Christianity. Bishop Benjamin T. Tanner wrote in 1895 in the, col in the Color of Solomon, what? That, bi that biblical scholars wrongly portrayed the son of David as a white man. That is a big injustice, people, because they've essentially taken something that was ours and they tried to make it theirs. But in doing so, they, let's say, tainted the original meaning of it all. Because they tried to take black excellence and separate the black from it. And you see that pretty often nowadays, right? Where people are misrepresented. People are taking credit for the work of others with, like, without a care in the world. Y'all work... Well, if you work an office job, you should know that very well. You put together the presentation, you get the stats for it and all that, but the man that stands forward to present it all isn't you. It's not you. And to have your hard work appropriated like that, imagine how that must feel to, a treat, to achieve such greatness, but... The message behind it all is completely alienated. Because, and why is that? Because it's not you delivering it. And that's a big problem. Let me see if I can find my spot here. I've, I've looked up. In the post-civil rights era, theologian uh, James H. Cohn, Cecile W. Cohn, and ja oh boy, Jacqueline Grant who came out of the AME tradition, critiqued Eurocentric Christianity and African-American churches for their shortcomings in fully impacting the plight of these oppressed by racism, sexism, and economic, oh boy, un economic disadvantage. I sorry to said that in underdevelopment at the same time. But again, that's another problem. They downplay our suffering. They downplay our disadvantage in life because they say... Because we have large numbers, because we come together and do what we do, all of a sudden our struggles are invalidated. And let me tell you this, because we suffer together does not mean we grow together. Because those that make it out are the ones that are apparently the poster boys now. But the, well, what about those left behind? There are those still down in the trenches, suffering, struggling, basically working all they can just to wake up the next morning. They talk to the Lord, they pray for some sort of blessing, some sort of way to end their suffering, but in the end, they still have their hardships to go through. And the Lord will raise them up, mind you, as he always does, but the people need to recognize that suffering for any true development to happen. Now, I'm going to keep coming back to this because, like I said, the Bible is y'all history books. And history, if you cannot understand it, is doomed to be repeated. Just like how these words, these words of God that can be spoken today by our pastor are so relevant today is because the people that don't read or understand the word of God 
are the ones that are heading our country. So as we move forward, reading and understanding the word of God, people of my age, we are the tip of the spear. You've paved our path, and now it's our turn to pave the rest of the way. That wasn't it. I still gotta, I still gotta talk about the present. There's, there's still one more. What about now? We've learned about our past, but what about now? The, the steps we take forward are very important. Now, allow me to read to y'all one more time. Today, this is a big achievement, mind you. Today, the African, Amer African Methodist Episcopal Church has membership in 12 Episcopal districts in 29 countries on five continents. The work of the church is administered by 21 active bishops and nine general officers who manage the developments of the church. This right here, this is us. Like I said, that black excellence. We are the ones that, we, we took our own space, we developed it, we cultivated it, we brought it around, and we managed to spread that throughout, how many was that? Nine countries? Five continents? Y'all can't tell me that's not impressive. Because, in the end of the day, we are excellent. We are black. We are excellent. Y'all got to say that in the mirror. Now, I probably done lost some of y'all speaking, speaking the way I have, but in all honesty, I'm just another young black man in a white man's world, but it won't always be that way. Because as long as my people continue to grow and prosper, this won't be a white man's world. This won't be any man's world because we need to bring it together to be a human's world. Amen. Let us stand. Come on, let's celebrate Jeremiah. Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. thousand years ago and so he has no hands but your hands he has no feet but your feet go and be the hands of Jesus go from here and be the feet of Jesus and the Lord bless you the Lord keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace now henceforth and forevermore let the saints of God sing you hug at least three people fist bump them and say it's good to see you this morning